All right, we're going to be talking about the SAT math section. And the first thing we always say about the SAT math is the SAT math is easy. And what we mean by that is not that if you can't do it, you're stupid. Uh, that's not all we mean. We don't want you to be personally offended by this statement. Uh, what we're saying is that SAT math really only uses basic principles, and every math question can be done very quickly. How quickly, uh, you might ask? Well, we find that every math question can be done in under 30 seconds. And, and we really mean that like, every math question can be done in under 30 seconds. So if you end up with half a page worth of calculations, you know you might be going a bit astray. Uh, we've actually done some speed tests to check to see how fast the SAT math can be done. Uh, what we found is that our best instructors can do 25 minute sections in under six minutes, which is under 18 seconds per question, which is kind of crazy, especially considering that of those 18 seconds, on average, about 10 of the seconds are reading the question. So it's 10 seconds to read the question, eight seconds to solve the question on average. So a little bit crazy, but uh, that is actually possible to, to do. Now, should you go uh, in six minutes? It's definitely not advisable to try to go that quickly. But knowing that each question could be done in under 30 seconds is actually quite valuable because you know if I end up with just a whole lot of work, then I know that my method for the particular question might not be the best method. So it's a really good check to know uh, when you're kind of going astray. So how is it even possible, though? Let's say we didn't want to actually try to, to do the section in under six minutes. If we did want to do that, how would that even be possible going as, as fast as you can and getting them all right, of course? I mean, you could do the whole section in under a minute if you just randomly bubble them. But if you want to get them all right in under six minutes, how could you do that? So the key is to find patterns and to use those patterns to your advantage, because someone who's good at math would be able to see patterns and be able to make connections between those patterns. And what we always say about the SAT math is that they're never coincidences, or we don't like to say never, but they're pretty much never any coincidences on the SAT math. So if there happens to be a pattern that you notice, there's probably something you can do with that pattern. It's probably not just a coincidence that that pattern is there. So what we're going to do in order to show our method, I suppose, for recognizing patterns on the SAT, uh, is that we're going to go through three math questions, and through those three math questions, that will demonstrate our strategy as far as pattern recognition. So the first question is this one. It says, if x plus y equals 11 and x minus y equals 4, find x squared minus y squared. So the first thing you might want to do on such a question is to count the number of variables in the number of equations. Because in this question, we see, OK, well, we have two variables. We have x and y, and we have two equations. We have x plus y equals 11 and x minus y equals 4. So we know that whenever we have two variables and two equations, we can solve the system of equations. And what you may know uh, as the, the two methods to solve a system of equations, well, actually, I guess there's a third method, which you could do by graphing, but that's definitely not the best method. The two main methods you can solve a system of equations are to solve it by substitution or by elimination. Substitution being to solve for one of the variables. So, for example, we could do y equals 11 minus x, and then plug back in uh, to the other equation, uh, and then solve for y. Uh, and then plug back into solve for x. Or you can do it by elimination, which is to line up the two equations and effectively cross something out, either the x or the y. So of those two methods, the cleaner one is actually to do elimination method, uh, at least in this particular problem. So let's go ahead and do it by elimination uh, for this problem. So if we line up the, the equations, we can see that we have x plus y equals 11, x minus y equals 4, and it really nicely lines up such that the plus y and the minus y can uh, go away. And if we added them together, we'd end up with 2x equals 15. And then we can divide both sides by 2 and get that x is 15 over 2. Now we have to solve for y, though. So we're going to go ahead and plug back in to one of the equations. It doesn't actually matter which one you plug back into. Uh, so we're just going to go ahead and plug into the first equation. So we're going to plug in to make it 15 over 2 plus y equals 11. And then to solve for y, we'd have to, do, we'd have to subtract 15 over 2 from both sides. And we get 11 minus 15 over 2 equals 22 over 2 minus 15 over 2 equals 7 over 2, because we had to get a common denominator here in order to get what y is. So we have now that x is 15 over 2 and that y is 7 over 2. So now finally, we need to plug back in to the original expression, which is x squared minus y squared. So we need to do 15 over 2 squared minus 7 over 2 squared equals 225 over 4 minus 49 over 4, which is 76 over 4, which is 44. So that was a lot of work. We had to do a lot of grunt work, really, to be able to, to solve that. And it definitely got us the right answer. I mean, we were able to get the answer of 44, and, and we're, it's completely right. But it definitely was a little bit tedious to do that, the question in this particular way.
And what you should know about the SAT, uh, and actually on most math tests, not just the SAT, is that generally speaking, you don't need to do a lot of grunt work unless your teacher is just really evil. And then maybe you have to do a lot of grunt work for, for math questions. But typically, most teachers, even in school, will make it such that there's kind of a nice way to do something uh, so that won't take you a whole lot of steps. So let's go back and look at this question at a high level. So there is a pattern here that we might notice which is the x squared minus y squared. Isn't it very, very strange that they would ask for x squared minus y squared? Why don't they just ask us for x or ask us for y or something like that? I mean, is that really oddly specific to ask for x squared minus y squared? It just seems so strange that they would, that they would ask for something so very specific. So surely that can't be a coincidence that they asked for something like that. So you may already recognize that pattern, and it is what's called a difference of squares which is factorable into x plus y times x minus y. Uh, and if we were to multiply that all out, if we were to FOIL it out, we'd end up with x squared minus xy plus xy minus y squared. And so the two middle terms are going to cancel out, and we're left with x squared minus y squared. And this is a very, very common pattern in the SAT. Difference of squares will come up quite a lot. Now, if we recognize that pattern, we can use it to our advantage, because we might recognize, oh, we have x plus y and we have x minus y. Well, I see an x plus y and I see an x minus y elsewhere in the problem. That seems pretty significant, doesn't it? So what we can actually do, and is a very uh, clever method, I suppose, is to just simply do 11 times 4, which is 44. So if we actually saw that on this particular question, if we recognize the high-level pattern and we use that high-level pattern to our advantage, this question would take literally three seconds. So that's something that we could have done on this question instead of doing it that long kind of grunt worky. So whenever we see a pattern that we recognize, we typically want to use it to our advantage. So if we ever see this difference of squares pattern, like we just saw in this question, in almost 100% of cases, we want to actually do something with that. And what are we going to do with that pattern? We're going to factor it, because that's all there really is to do that pattern. Now, on the flip side, let's say we saw the pattern x plus y times x minus y. If we saw that pattern, we want to actually multiply it out. And the reason that you want to do that in the case of having x plus y times x minus y is that the SAT put that pattern there for you to notice it. And so if you see it one way, you should do it the other way. So if you see x squared minus y squared, factor it into x plus y times x minus y. If you see it as x plus y times x minus y, then you want to multiply it out to x squared minus y squared. So you might have seen that question. You said, well, that question was pretty easy. I saw that right off the bat. Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. But uh, now we're actually going to do a slightly harder question that, where we can also take advantage of patterns. But before we actually do that, what we're going to talk about is the two primary ways to solve SAT questions. So one way to solve an SAT question is to do it what we call the poet's way. And the second way to solve it is the school way. So the poet's way is kind of the nice, elegant way to solve a question. It's kind of like poetry. It's just like it's nice and flowing and just nice. And the school way, it gets the job done, but it's a little bit grunt worky. So generally speaking, the school way is going to involve much more memorization and just much more kind of following a pattern that you just like, you know, a very, very low level pattern that you learned in school. Like, oh, I have a system of equations. I can just like set it up, plug it in, just plug and chug. And I can just kind of like go through all the motions uh, and solve it that way. So you are still recognizing patterns, of course, but, but the patterns are a little bit lower level patterns rather than high level patterns like we're doing with the poetic way. With the poetic way, we really kind of saw how things connected and we saw, oh, we saw the x squared minus y squared. That's something that actually connects to something else in the question, which is the x plus y and the x minus y. So you saw that we actually did that problem in both ways. We did it the school way first, and then we did it the poetic way second. And certainly the poetic way was the better way to go on this particular problem. So let's do a harder problem now. So this problem we have, if a plus b squared equals 36 and a minus b squared equals 16, what is the value of 4ab? Now, if you're being totally honest with yourself, ask yourself the question, would I have done this question by square rooting both sides of the first equation, square rooting both sides of the second equation, then using those two equations to get solve for a and b, and then plug it into 4ab. You probably would if you're being totally honest with yourself. Maybe you wouldn't, although if you wouldn't, I'd actually be kind of curious as to how you're planning on solving this question, because it's actually not that easy of a question to solve if you don't do it that way. And actually another small complication with taking the square root of both sides of these equations is that if we have a plus b squared equals 36, then if you take the square root of both sides, you actually have to consider the positive and the negative, because a plus b could be positive 6 
or a plus b could be negative 6. Um, and that actually is going to present some problems, but it'll actually work out in either case. So you could actually do it uh, that way and get 4ab by solving for a and b individually on this particular one, because we do have the same number of variables and equations. But just like on the previous question, we want to see if we can look at a higher level and really see the higher level patterns and see if we can do something with the higher level patterns. So even though we can solve for a and b, it's kind of weird that they asked us for 4 ab. So just like in the previous question that they asked us for x squared minus y squared, isn't it really, really oddly specific that, that they would ask for 4 ab? That just seems so weird that they would ask for something so specific. And it's probably not a coincidence, once again. So there's probably something we can do with that pattern. So let's see what kind of patterns we see. So just like we found the difference of squares pattern before, the a squared minus b squared, there are a couple other patterns that we want to know and be able to recognize at a high level, which is that a plus b squared equals a squared plus 2ab plus b squared, and that a minus b squared is equal to a squared minus 2ab plus b squared. And this is just how to square something. Now, could you FOIL this out every single time? You certainly could, but because these patterns occur very frequently on the SAT, you want to know them. And generally speaking, we're very anti-memorization. We hate memorizing things that are unnecessary. But the difference of squares pattern is definitely something that you should memorize. Uh, you should also memorize how to square something, because you want to know how to square something very quickly, not have to FOIL it out every single time. So we have the a squared plus 2ab plus b squared equals 36 and a squared minus 2ab plus b squared equals 16. So let's see what kind of pattern now we see, so or what kind of connections we can make in this question. So if we're looking at these two equations, let's look at what the differences are in these two equations. So obviously the 36 and the 16 are different in the two equations. But the other main difference is that the middle term for the left equation is 2ab, and the middle term for the right equation is negative 2ab. And again, it seems really strange that the middle terms are the different ones, and those are really, really similar to 4ab. So maybe there's something we can do with that. Maybe there's some way we can use the 2ab and the minus 2ab in order to connect it to the 4ab. Maybe there's something we can do. So it's just too big of a coincidence that the 2ab and the minus 2ab are there and we have a 4ab. It just can't be happenstance that it's that way. So what we can do, and what perhaps you have seen at this point, is that we can actually line up the equations and eliminate them. So we can actually use elimination method, uh, similar actually to the way we used on the school way for the previous question. But in this case, the elimination method is a very poetic way. Because if we line them up, we actually see that the a squareds go away and the b squareds go away, and we're actually left with 4ab equals 20, which is quite nice. It just worked out really, really well. So this question might take us a little bit more than three seconds. It might be more like eight seconds. but it's still very, very fast. So you can see that both for this question as well as for the previous question, there was a very poetic way to do the question that got us the answer very, very quickly. So we're done with this question and we can see just how easy it was. So algebra questions on the SAT often have really nice patterns. And so we just learned three patterns that we want to be able to recognize at a high level and be able to use. But what about other kinds of questions? What about, for example, a graphing question? Or what about a geometry question? Are there any patterns that we could find on those kinds of questions? Is there something we can do as far as pattern recognition or making connections? And indeed, there are very many things that we can do. So let's do this question together. It says, in the figure, A, B, C, D is a rectangle. Points A and B lie on the graph of Y equals PX squared. If the area of the rectangle above is 12 square units, what is the value of P? So on this particular question, there really are no algebraic patterns we're necessarily going to be able to find. There's no difference of squares you can find here. Squaring, doing a plus b squared is not going to apply. And it's just going to be difficult to find algebraic patterns like we did in the previous two questions. But there are still patterns to be found. So, and then that's actually just generally what you're going to find is that every math question on the SAT, and actually just generally uh, when you do math questions, not just on the SAT, math is all about seeing patterns and making connections. That's really what math is. I mean, you seen a type of question before and you recognize that kind of question and you can kind of use that pattern that you've sort of seen before to your advantage. Now for this particular question, what kind of patterns do we see? So one type of pattern that you might want to be looking for for a geometry question or for a graphing question is the concept of looking for interesting points. And what we mean by interesting points is generally a place where some kind of connection is made. So 
a connection might be made between, you know, say, a parabola and the corners of a rectangle. Or let's say we had a triangle that was inscribed in a circle. If we had a triangle inside a circle, where are the interesting points there? Well, probably the vertices, where the things touch. Right? So any place where something touches is probably interesting. That's probably where the action is going to happen. So on this particular question, you might ask yourselves, well, where are the interesting points? Like, where should I be looking to in order to kind of find stuff that's where something's likely to happen? So if we look at A, B, C, D, and origin, there are five points there. So there are kind of five candidates for things that might be interesting. Now, could I pick just a random point in the parabola that's not one of those five? I guess I could, but that seems pretty unlikely to be very helpful to just pick a random point in the parabola. So of those five points, which ones are the most interesting? Well, points C and D are not on the parabola, so those seem less interesting. And then the origin, 0, 0, that is on the parabola and it is on the rectangle, but it's not on one of the corners. So the most interesting points are probably going to be A and B because they're both corners of the rectangle. And there are both points on the parabola. And that's definitely a place where a connection forms. So any place where a connection forms is potentially going to be very interesting. That's sort of where we expect something to happen. Now, before we continue on this question, let's first talk about what a good math student would do. So someone who is like kind of not necessarily super genius, but at least good at math. What, what would someone who's good at math do on such a question or just on any question in general? So the first thing that someone who's good at math would do is that a person would see patterns and make connections. That's actually what we've been doing on the previous two questions and what we've started to do on this question. That's what math is. I mean, math is all about seeing patterns and making connections. So if there are two patterns in the question, you want to think about, okay, how can I connect those patterns? Or if there's a pattern in the question and there's a pattern that I know in my brain, then I want to see how can I connect the pattern in my brain to the pattern in the question? Or if I have two patterns in my brain, how can I connect those two patterns? So you're always looking to connect patterns. So that's the first thing that someone who's good at math uh, would do. The second thing, and this is actually the more important thing, is that math problems are not solved all at once. So what a lot of students will do when they look at a math question is they'll just sort of stare at it and just hope that magically the answer will just come if you just keep staring long enough. And so most students kind of just like passively wait for the answer to come, whereas students who are very good at math will tend to be more proactive about trying to find a solution. And if you don't immediately see what there is to do, then to just try to see, okay, well, what patterns do I notice? What connections do I see that I can make? Because, you know, math questions aren't solved all at once, and especially for very difficult math problems, maybe if there's six connections I'm going to have to ultimately make, rather than trying to, like, make the giant leap to the final answer, I need to instead, let's just focus on the first connection and see, okay, let me make one connection and see where that takes me. If I just write something down, or make some kind of pattern, or see some kind of pattern, and make a connection, maybe making that connection will bring me closer to the final destination, and then I'll be able to solve the question. So going back to this question, what was the first mental connection we can make in this question? Well, we actually already made it. We said, where are the interesting points? So that's as simple as, as it gets for the first mental connection. We don't need to do anything beyond that. We could just say, OK, mental connection number one is that there are two interesting points. A and B are the most interesting places to us because those are both places where the parabola and the rectangle connect, and specifically at the corners of the rectangle. And that's really all we need to do. So we can see that if there end up being six connections on this, and in our opinion, that there do end up being six connections. So now we've actually made the first mental connection. So we're kind of good to go on that first mental connection. As you can see, it's in green now. So now that we're looking at those interesting points, the next thing you want to ask yourself is, okay, now that I found one pattern, there's a pattern that I found, is there anything I can do with that pattern? Is there anywhere I can go from there? And so if you're really focusing your vision on points A and B, and you're really looking to see, okay, what can I do with points A and B that might be kind of interesting? You know, what could I possibly do with them? So if you're looking at the coordinates, point A says 3 comma little a, and point B says negative 3 comma little b. And if you're really looking at those two coordinates, what you might next say is, well, you can actually find the distance between those two coordinates. We can actually find that the distance between a and b is 6, that you could do 3 minus negative 3 is 6, or you can say that the distance from the y-axis to a is 3 and the distance from the y-axis to b is 3, and therefore that it must be 6. And so that would be the next mental connection we might make here. So now that we've made that connection, now that we've figured out that in this rectangle that the base is 6, what can we do next? 
So what you may want to ask yourself, and actually just in general, what's a good idea, is to use the information in the question, because it's very rare on the SAT that they give you information that you don't need. So what pieces of information have we not used yet in this question? We haven't used the y equals px squared yet, and we also haven't used the fact that the area of the rectangle is 12 square units. And what you want to be thinking about here is, based on the mental connections that I've made thus far, is there anything that I could connect to the piece of information I haven't used? And indeed, we can connect the mental connections we've made thus far to a piece of information we haven't used, which is that the area of the rectangle is 12 square units, because that is very connected to the fact that the base is 6. And what we can do is we can say that the height is 2, because in a rectangle, the area of a rectangle is base times height. And so we can say, well, if the base is 6 and the area is 12, that the height must be 2. And so that would be the third mental connection that we can make here. So now that we're looking at that third mental connection, again, we want to ask ourselves, OK, can we push the problem forward at all from here? Is there anything we can now say about other pieces of the problem? So we said actually at the very beginning of this question that points A and B are the interesting points. And now that we've found the height of the rectangle, we actually know more information about the interesting points. We can actually say what the y-coordinate is for the interesting points, which seems very valuable potentially. So let's go ahead and do that as the fourth mental connection. We can say now that little a and little b are both 2. So the coordinates are 3, 2 and negative 3, 2 for points a and b, respectively. So that's as simple as it gets for the fourth mental connection. And of course, it's debatable as to what each mental connection is here. But this is sort of what we boil down how we sort of cut the connections. You could have perhaps combined connections, or you could have broken it up. But this is what we said were the mental connections. So now that we have found the points, of A and B. OK, where can I go from here? What mental connections do I see? What patterns do I see? OK, what piece of information have I not used thus far? I haven't used the y equals px squared yet. And you want to think to yourself, OK, is there any connection I can form between the fact that I now know the coordinates for A and B and the fact that I have an equation for the parabola? And indeed, there is something you can do, which is that you can plug in a point. And that's actually something we'll get into more when we talk about graphing. But the important concept here is that when you have a point that's on a graph, you can plug it into the equation for that graph, and it must make a true statement. That's actually, in fact, the definition of a graph. The definition of a graph is that it's the set of all points that makes an equation true. And so you know that plugging either point A or B to that equation must make a true statement. So it doesn't actually matter which one we plug in. We can plug in 3, 2 or negative 3, 2. So let's just go ahead and try 3, 2. And the next logical connection, once we plug in 3, 2, is just simply to solve for p. So that one's a pretty easy one. So if we plug in 3, 2, we get 2 equals p times 3 squared, and then 2 equals 9p, and then p equals 2 ninths. And then finally, we're done. We don't even need that second point. So we've kind of made the final connection, and now we've actually created a path from the beginning to the very end that we were able to now travel along and we have the answer to the question. So by breaking down that question, we were able to solve it pretty quickly. So it's a little bit debatable as to how fast this question would be, but I would say almost certainly this question could be done under 15 seconds. So this was not a particularly hard question. Now, speaking of how hard this question is, uh, this particular question was actually a gridden question. And gridden questions, the first gridden question is number nine, and the last gridden question is number 18. It's on the, the math section that actually has 18 questions, the first eight of which being multiple choice, and then the last 10 of which being gridden questions. And what uh, you, you may have already seen when you looked at the presentation on the structure of the SAT is that the math questions go in order of difficulty. And for the multiple choice, for the eight multiple choice on that section, it gets harder. So number one is the easiest one, number eight is the hardest one. And then at number nine, when you get to the gridden questions, it gets easier again. So number nine is supposed to be the easiest gridden question, and then number 18 is supposed to be the hardest gridden question. So my question to you is for this particular question that we just did, where do you expect to find that kind of question? So if you were to look in a section for the grid ends, you know, would it be number 18? Would it be number 17? Would it be number 9, number 10? You know, where do you think it would be? And just think about that for a second based on sort of how easy this question was and where you think it would be placed. Now, typically when we, uh, when we do this, ask that question to students who are, who are participating in person, what most students say is that this one are probably found in the middle or maybe even toward the beginning. That, you know, you'd find it maybe question 10, 11, 12, 13, something in that, in that range. And what may actually be quite shocking to you for this particular question is that this question 
was number 18. It was the very hardest question on the Grinnan section, which is kind of crazy. But hopefully this demonstration has demonstrated that even the hardest questions can be quite easy if you take a very methodical approach to the math and you are constantly looking for patterns and trying to find connections between different parts of the problem. So now let's recap what we covered uh, in this lesson. The first thing we covered, actually on really all the questions, is that you always want to try to do each math question in the poetic way or the poet's way. Because most questions in the SAT and just generally on math questions, most problems will have an elegant solution. There's usually going to be a nice clean way that will allow you to solve the question in certainly under 30 seconds and in many cases 10 seconds. So that's what you always want to be trying to do. Now at the same time, you don't want to spend too long searching a poetic way. So let's say we're talking about that first question we did, the one that said x plus y equals 11, x minus y equals 4, find x squared minus y squared. So let's say we looked at that question and we looked at the question for 10 seconds and within 10 seconds we couldn't see the poetic way or we couldn't see a way to kind of a pattern that we, that we recognize that we could use to our advantage. So within the first 10 seconds, if there's no pattern that you see that you can use to your advantage, then just go ahead and do it the school way. Just go ahead and do it the way you know how to do it. Because at the very least on that question, you knew there were two variables and there were two equations. So you know that there's going to be a school way to solve it. That you can solve for x and y individually and then plug in for x squared minus y squared. So if you can't find the poetic way in the first 10 seconds, do it the way you know how to do it. Don't just waste time looking for that poetic way. But at the same time, you always want to be careful about having too many calculations. Because if I end up with half of a page of work, that's probably too much. And then the next thing is that we discussed three types of algebraic patterns. We discussed differences of squares. So a squared minus b squared equals a plus b times a minus b. We discussed squaring something, both a plus b and a minus b. a plus b squared is equal to a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. And a minus 2ab, or minus, a minus b squared equals a squared minus 2ab plus b squared. And those are the three algebraic patterns we've discussed thus far. We also discussed that on geometry and graphing problems, finding interesting points is very valuable because that's where something is likely to happen. So the main lesson from this particular presentation is that there's typically going to be a poetic way to do a problem, and we can often use the patterns that we see in the question to our advantage. And one of the most important things we discussed is to not try to just stare at the question and hope that the answer comes to you to always just be looking for the next pattern you see and to see what can I do with that pattern? What connection can I make? How can I push this problem forward in order to hopefully get me closer to the final answer?